We're live. Uh, we're live. Good afternoon, West Coasters. Good early evening for those of those on the East Coast. We're back at it again. Uh, this time we're equipped and empowered to get through this interview. Uh, we believe in the sovereignty of God. And so uh, he used technical difficulties to make this conversation, Lord willing, the conversation that will be on our platform, uh, very uh, provocative uh, topic that we're going to dive into um, the importance of creatives. Um, this is writers, actors, um, like our brother here, uh, controlling content. Uh, for so long, uh, we have been crippled and stagnated, especially in the African-American community, um, as it relates to um, getting our story out. Uh, we want to get it out under the conditions we want to get it out uh, with the respect that we deserve in light of those things. And uh, here's one that is taking a courageous step in that area. Uh, I want to begin this way um, by going right into the subject um, that led him um, to uh, make the statements that he made towards uh, powerhouses of his industry uh, with no fear, with no sense of a worry of repercussions, but just a clear conscious, uh, courageous focus. Um, what he, uh, and then we'll go backwards from there. Let's do it that way. Uh, we'll find out a little bit more about him, a little bit more about his journey um, at the same time. But let me uh, also say that this brother is a faithful and loving member of our uh, the Mount Sinai Church. He is a dear uh, a friend. And so we are I'm glad um, that we were able to sit down with him. And uh, maybe as time um, presents itself, you'll hear more about um, how he got connected with our church in the midst of his pursuits and how that would be an encouragement. Certainly um, in the podcast that we did earlier, I was able to hear that and that was an encouragement to me and I believe it'll be encouragement so to so many others. Do us a quick favor, like this page, share this page, uh, be on the lookout uh, for Thursday when we'll sit down with my dear friend and mentor, uh, Pastor Keelan Atkinson, pastor of the Word Fellowship Reformed Baptist Church in Greenboro, North Carolina, is our Theological Thursday. Uh, we'll have in-depth conversations with him about everything that's taking place in our landscape from the pandemic, from the political uh, chaotic, chaotic, chaotic season that we're in, the protests based off the civil unrest, the mental strain that so many people are facing, and the economic uncertainty in light of all these things. Um, uh, check out our Hurt for the Hurting YouTube channel. You'll find uh, so many, a vast um, uh, diversity of interviews and conversations from Money Matters uh, to uh, celebrate, celebrating our sisters in various fields and areas from ministry uh, to the world of academia and so on. Uh, and please check that out on the Hurt for the Hurting YouTube channel, pastors and preachers navigating their way through the pandemic and so on. Uh, subscribe to that channel, like those uh, videos, uh, make some positive comments down there for us. But let's drive right in. Um, as you come into the room and share and like this page, let's dive right in. Uh, Jay, unmute yourself and let us know uh, how you're doing today. I'm doing fine. Thank you. Uh, feeling healthy, feeling mm -hmm. um, positive in spite of so many negative things happening around us um, and yeah. just trying to stay faithful, trying to stay, you know, in it, in it to win it. Before we dive into the nuances and the minutia of what we're going to talk about, uh, I, I want to celebrate with you. I know COVID um, caused you to miss a, a one of the glorious days that uh, both men and women um, look forward to, that day of marriage, finding that one special person uh, that stand before God to say you want to commit yourself like commit yourself to life to and one uh, because of COVID uh, that was switched um, and that's coming up. Uh, so we want to tell you uh, congratulations on that. Uh, anything you want to give us any scoop onto uh, uh, that story, that perspective, how you're feeling as a picture? Uh, yeah, it's been you know I, I, what I know for certain after this much time. Um, being at home in the middle of a pandemic is that 
it's clearly a time where relationships are in a make it or break it type of uh, scenario. And I'm thankful that uh, my relationship with my lovely fiance, Tamika, has been a make it scenario. So we are uh, we've had to reschedule our wedding. It was initially scheduled September 7th, uh, Memorial Day. And um, that was going to be in New Jersey. Labor Day. Labor Day yeah, excuse me. I mix them up all the time. So uh, we, we had to we, we couldn't do it actually in New Jersey. And we were going to have a gathering of minimum 175 people. Naturally, under the circumstances, that is not possible or safe at the time. And so we've had to kind of figure out a way to still proceed with the marriage, but in a very small private way. And then later on, we're going to look at doing a, a larger celebration and reception uh, when when that becomes a safe uh, thing to be able to do. Praise God. Um, congratulations again. I look forward to uh, celebrating with you all um, on that. Uh, talk to us about um, what has gotten you a lot of media lately. Um, however you want to dive into it, we'll, we'll, we'll get into the questions um, as you uh, sort of give us the backdrop and how that relates to our subject today, which is creators controlling their content. Mm -hmm. So to begin with, there is a whole lot happening in the industry in terms of a lot of um, changes that are supposed to be made for the better. Uh, but to, to give a backdrop in terms of um, a statement that I recently released, the, the context all comes down to different companies, corporations, uh, public yeah, entities. Let, let us know what the industry is. Let us know what the industry oh, that you're talking about. I'm talking about entertainment industry, film, TV, but that also includes sports. Um, that's a part of the entertainment industry. All of it, everything you go to for entertainment and media. And certainly within the last few months in light of the Black Lives Matter movement, in light of all of the um, egregious situations that have happened to people of color, particularly black men and women, um, different entities, companies, corporations, and even public figures have uh, released statements and, and made public their uh, thoughts, whether it be in solidarity with Black Lives Matter, whether it be to condemn white supremacy, so on and so forth. And it's really important for those of us who actually are in business and operate and function with these institutions, companies, corporations, or what have you, that if we see them speaking publicly, uh, and we know oftentimes, unfortunately, those are politically correct types of statements or, or uh, virtue signaling, as many people will call it, symbolic gestures that oftentimes don't really reflect the day-to-day -day business activity and functioning that goes on behind the scenes. And that's what um, I found myself really having to face uh, with regard to Netflix and Lionsgate. Unfortunately, those public statements didn't really reflect what took place with regard to the business of show. Um, there's the, the reality, the phrase often spoken, show business. Uh, but I learned from an actress, uh, Shona Tucker, on the East Coast, the business of show. And in the business <laughs> end, uh, people of color are consistently underpaid, consistently underpaid in relation to white actors. Uh, that's a problem. And across the industry, there have been statistics that have been done. There have been other people who have come out and spoken about it. Um, Gabrielle Union, Viola Davis. Of course, Monique had a, a situation as well with Netflix. So this has been ongoing. It's not new or a surprise to anyone, but it just happened to come upon me because it was a very clear and blatant situation unfortunately. And so I had to speak on it. And uh, in doing so, I quit the show. I walked away from it and I wanted to make sure that people knew why. And so there's an investigation going on. There's more to come from that. So I, I won't speak in too much more detail. But in general, I think it's important that um, artists understand the power of their voice and that artists are not afraid to speak up and call out injustice where, where it's happening. So much irony to that because the show you speak of and Dear White People, if we could say that, um, is um, 
it's supposed to be this backdrop of conversation and tension and the very thing uh, that uh, you are addressing and dealing with um, show uh, shows his face um, in this reality. So there, there's a lot of irony, uh, irony, I should say, uh, to that. Um, as you as you mull over this in your journey, um, as you mull over this in your journey, how much did your journey pay pay uh, play a role into your uh, willingness or or courage uh, to sort of, as you say, walk away? Um, take us through that journey, and as you narrate us through that journey, maybe give us a glimpse into the lessons that you are learning to prepare you now. Uh, I think it's so critical because oftentimes um, we don't appreciate uh, the the steep heels in the journey. We just like the crossing of the finish line and the downward flow uh, that often comes with it. Um, you're you're you graduate from one of the leading art schools, alumni, very names that come from that. Um, you're doing theater. You travel about ten dollars, eleven dollars in your pocket. Uh, in your car, have a tank of gas to to get from New York to LA, sleeping on people's couches, mentors helping you out. Just walk us through that whole process um, and let us know um, what the lessons you think that are taking place then in that what we would label as difficult season uh, mm -hmm. to press forward to prepare you for this now uh, courageous season. Got you. Well, I think, uh, I suppose it's, it's most appropriate to really start where I come from. I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and was uh, the oldest son of, uh, of a single mother who raised four boys. And so naturally, I think one can imagine that I didn't grow up with uh, a whole lot of resources. We had what we needed, but we didn't always have what we wanted. And so there was definitely um, a, a humble you know, struggle in terms of my upbringing, but I generally had a happy childhood um, and me and my brothers had lots of fun and we kind of uh, did the things that we could do. To ourselves. But moving um, into the conversation about my career, um, I went to Juilliard in New York. I spent five years living in New York, which is really an incredible experience, um, really an experience that I underwent a serious uh, crucible, if you will, of um, training, being able to train uh, on the highest level, but also I was exposed to a whole lot of amazing talent and a whole lot of amazing art within the confines of the actual school, but also being in New York City, going out to see Broadway shows. And I had a privilege of uh, being able to get free tickets because the majority of the time I had teachers who were working on shows out there. So we would get ticket offers to go see stuff. And I'm a broke college student sitting in the orchestra level watching some amazing art. So I got to um, see that often. And, and that really informed my my sense of taste in art and my sense of um, work ethic as well. Um, but also, you know, being an artist in New York, you know, you got to pay bills and and theater has never really been a great way of bringing in income, unfortunately. I mean, it's a, it's a love effort and it takes a lot of work, um, but theater generally does not pay a whole lot, even if you're on Broadway. And so while I was in New York, I had to hustle. I had to find other gigs. And so I was dishwashing in a club in Soho, uh, scrubbing toilets, cleaning bathrooms, mopping floors, all of that. Uh, and this is right out of getting out of school. And so I always kind of had a, a serious sense of work ethic. I started working as soon as I can uh, when I became 16, you know, I um, was able to get a job at Taco Bell, my first job, and uh, really get my work ethic from my mom. And so I always know that it, regardless of if I'm, I'm working in the industry, entertainment industry, I'm still going to have my hand in some pot where I'm able to work legitimately and bring in income for myself. So uh, to start where I left off, I suppose, in New York, um, I decided that it was time for me to get out of New York. I had pretty much gone as far as I could go. Um, it's, a, it's a rough city to live in when, you, when you're a struggling actor. <laughs> and so I, uh, 
I made the decision. Uh, my lease was actually up the summer of 2014. And so I decided, you know, it's, it's time to jump. I'm going to go to L.A. And I had a car, which was uh, uh, my first car was a Honda Accord. And I had about a quarter tank of gas. And I drove from New York. I got as far as like New Jersey and I, I hit up one of my mentors and just let him know, look, man, I'm, I'm, I'm taking a leap here. I need to get to L.A. Thankfully, at that point, I also had a manager and an agent who were in Los Angeles. Um, as I graduated from Juilliard, one of the things you do before you graduate is there's an actor showcase where you showcase different scenes to really show what your range is as an artist. And then that results in meetings with different managers, agents, casting directors, so on and so forth. And so I was able to get connected. Um, so I had representation here in LA, but I didn't have a place to live. I didn't have any real uh, savings or finances that would enable me to, to have a stable um, uh, living situation when I first got out here. But I knew I just needed to be here. I didn't want to be in New York anymore. And I didn't want to do theater so much anymore. I wanted to jump into TV and film. So I, I finally got out here um, after a very interesting and, and uh, really memorable road trip across the country. And I was able to, uh, a good friend of mine was actually getting ready to shoot a movie in Northern California. And I had hit her up probably about a day or two before I was about to drive out. And it just so happens that she was getting ready to leave for a month. And so she gave me the keys to her apartment and I got to stay uh, in her apartment for about a month while she was up in Northern California shooting this movie. And so that was a huge blessing because uh, you couldn't have planned it better. Uh, certainly I should have. But in terms of me just taking the leap, it just worked out that way. And so what, my first month here, I was really just trying to get on my feet, trying to, you know, search for jobs, washing dishes, cafes, whatever I could get. It'll just bring in some income. And um, I ended up finding a, a job where I would be a bar back at this bar downtown, which essentially is cleaning dishes and collecting all of the used uh, drinks from around the, the venue. And I did that for a while and ended up, you know, started to bartend and, 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 and went into um, catering companies where I would be a bartender for different um, events and things like that. But the first few months were definitely sleeping on couches, sleeping in my car, um, going to different shelters to get, you know, food or, or supplies, stuff like that. And I'm, I'm so grateful for the resources that have been made available through the city of L.A., Shout out to um, uh, uh, California um, EBT because <laughs> that was a big help. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, there are so many wonderful resources that I was able to benefit from, which I'm very grateful for. But I also had the support of my mother, I had the support of different family members and friends who, who really were able to believe in me and, and try to invest in me and, and help me, even if it was just a few dollars for gas and things like that. So that as the backdrop for me as an artist is important because that informs who I am and the choices that I make. I also happen to be a, a Jesus loving, following Christian. And so that also informs me in my work as an artist. I also happen to be a student of People like Malcolm X, people like Shirley Chisholm, Vanny Lou Hamer, and uh, Cornell West, you know, brilliant minds, brilliant black minds, and people who are willing to uh, really put their lives on the line to be able to ensure the survival and liberty of other black people in this country. And I definitely um, have not only been inspired by those people, but I've been a beneficiary of their sacrifices. And so when it comes to my arena, my domain as an artist, uh, working in TV, film, or theater, and I experience things that are problematic or uh, controversial with regard to how not just people of color being treated, but anything. If it's, a, if it's a gender issue, whatever the case may be, if there's something that's wrong and I can do something about it, I'm going to try. And so that's what informs me. I mean, money, 
I walked away from money, certainly. And it, it was no small amount on this show that I walked away from. But I know mm -hmm. that money, money comes and goes, you know, that, right. that there's right. no amount that's just going to buy my silence to to not only um, demean my own sense of self-worth and integrity, but also to perpetuate the same types of problematic uh, status quo um, functioning that many of these businesses and uh, corporations go about doing. So that's really where I stand in terms of uh, the decision I made to walk away from that show. But just in general, I, I know that um, it's not just about money. You know, of course, we got to make a living, subsist mm -hmm. and, and be able to survive. But it's got to be more to it than that. And, and unfortunately, some people, it is just about money. Some people just go take the money and, and be quiet or whatever. Um, but I'm just not that kind of person. Hopefully, I that wonder, I wonder, answers it. Yeah, that was perfect. That was perfect. I wonder if you um, find a connection where I find a connection um, with your ability to walk away um, in the way that you did. Having come through the ranks, having done the hard work of study, having done the hard work of paying your dues, having uh, not being handed a situation and I, I celebrate those that have resources or parents that are in certain industries and open doors for them because we need that as well, um, especially um, in our race. And I'm sure the Lord bless you with a child and they were interested in going into the area of entertainment. You would do everything to uh, to position your, your, your relationships, um, to uh, utilize them in a way to make their journey a little bit less difficult, and you probably also will instill in them the values that created this. However, I think there is a connection, a more organic connection. That will be a formal process of you doing that uh, with your child and others who have done that um, in our community. But there is something more organic about um, having to scratch and surface and wait for the call uh, uh, <laughs> to uh, duplicate and uh, take the pictures uh, to make the copies of the resume uh, to stand outside an hour early. I don't think you go through that to get to this point and just, um, well, at least um, to get to this point and easily compromise uh, mm -hmm. certain principles and values that help you get to a certain point. Um, what's your thought on that and anything you want to elaborate um, if you do agree with that point? I definitely do. I think there's a level of appreciation for the journey um, and a level of appreciation for the craft. I mean, they're, they're, I'll give you a great example. Um, it, it's something that recently happened on, on the last show that I was working on. Um, and I think it's a lesson that I learned because I think there's a reality that many people want to get to the top, so to speak, you know, take mm -hmm. take that high in any industry, want to get to the top. And sometimes if an opportunity is given, you might think you're ready for it. But if you haven't really put in the work or don't know what the work is involved, you know, what's involved in the work, sometimes you may not actually be ready to be at the top unless you've really put in that kind of work. And so uh, just as an example, I had a barber. I was going to this barber who I've been going to for a while. And on set, I was uh, on 68 Whiskey, the show that I was most recently working on. A uh, great show. It only is going to be for one season. They couldn't do any more than one season. But I'm grateful that I got to be involved in that one season. Uh, in any case, I, I brought my barber on. He had never been on a set before. He had always wanted to get out of the barber shop. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that was his dream to be able to work on this level. So I gave him this shot. I gave him this opportunity. And it was something that he really didn't have to work for. It was really just he was connected, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. Unfortunately, what ended up occurring was he would show up late, and he'd be showing up like hour late. He'd be, we'd have a photo shoot situation for promo stuff. He's nowhere to be found. And of course, that was a bad reflection on me. Um, and I made it clear to him that that would not be acceptable. But time and again, it just was happening. 
So of course we had to we had to end that. I mean, he 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 couldn't no longer go forward with us. But I then became connected with another barber who had been kind of working through the the hair uh, union uh, for for the different film and TV sets for many years. He worked with lots of different celebrities and stuff, but still was kind of making his um, uh, paying his dues in terms of getting what they call hours so that he could actually get to the level where he's in the union. Well, I got connected with him. He was showing up early. <laughs> he was on time. You know, anytime we need him there, he was able to do everything I asked. And, and I'm still working with this guy. I just got cut by him the other day. He has his own shop over at the Crenshaw mall. This was somebody who had been in it for a while and who had been putting in the work. And I've, under, I've come to understand that oftentimes people don't really appreciate or perhaps just can't appreciate being a, a, on a certain level if you haven't kind of started from the bottom, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And I know I have. <laughs> Coming from Milwaukee, there was no direct path to what I'm trying to do here uh, and have yeah. been doing. No direct path of, oh, just call this person. There's an agency here in Milwaukee. There was none of that. All it was was a dream. And I started in theater, went to an arts elementary school and would just keep kind of chipping away at this dream and doing whatever it was that I could do that would put me on a path that was not particularly um, um, a beaten path for me. And certainly by faith and a lot of support, I was able to manage to get to where I am. Um, but it's also worth saying, too, that and, and, I, and I constantly say this, that if I never work again as an actor, if I become if Jeremy Tardy's this wash up actor who, you know, five, 10 years from now, people, you know, that's the dude who used to be on such and such. I, my joy and my level of, of appreciation to my God and, and to, to my faith for, for what I've already been able to accomplish will never diminish because I've already mm -hmm. gone much further than the dream I've had when I was a five-year-old boy who wanted to be on TV. That's been superseded by this wonderful, divine, merciful creator who, who, who had enough grace to say, you know what? You can do it. And so um, that's also why walking away from anything um, is, is with regard to uh, certainly the industry is not going to be a big thing for me because I know that I've already come a long way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, again, you know, us Midwesterners, we have that kind of chip on our shoulder, especially when we're in the New Yorks and the LA and being from Detroit, same flow. Uh there's just a certain inherent grind um because there's there's not the palm trees, it's not the place where people come to tour. Um <laughs> and, oh. and people there family reunion, they're there for, you know, funeral or, or something of that nature. Um, so it just, it builds something just inherently in you, especially when you um, transplant your plate self to other places, uh, things that people well, second nature take for granted. Um, you're just, you're, 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 you're vasting in it. And some people move for those reason, regions and get caught up and become very plastic. Um, but for the most part, um, there is a little extra oomph on top of whatever else and people may inherently uh, have. And that could be you could be from anywhere and have those things. But there is a little extra oomph when you're in those Midwest, Cleveland, Detroit, yeah. you know, Milwaukee. Um, <laughs> that cold, it, it, it does something to you. When you get out there in that cold, it ain't no messing yeah. around. Get right to cold it. Weather, right? Right? Cold weather does something to you for real, for real. Uh, you you been through some stuff just to get to school and things of that nature, and get to work um, and things of that nature. Talk to me about from a vision standpoint when you think about um, the type of platforms that could be created, um, not just from African American perspective, but I think uh, to be Christian and African American. I just had this conversation. Um, I think with Pastor Cooper on last Thursday, there's always a dual fight taking place. You know, we we're, we're, we really don't all never fit totally in when you have those two frameworks because, you know, the left, the extreme left, uh, will leave a we will have to leave them some point morally, 
in the extreme right, we have to leave them someplace socially. Um, we we are we are still holding on to our to our pillars of righteousness. Not that we live up to that standard of righteousness, but we still have those pillars in us um, from the left perspective. Um, sometimes, and then from the right perspective, sometimes uh, they can be very aloof to the social, more explicitly racial implications. If you were, if you were at a vision of what that looked like, and I can ask you this question because uh, long before any of these, uh, you were sending me, and we were talking about, you know, creating strips for the Book of Job and uh, doing these type of things that get not just African American content out there, but Christian content as well. What in your mind? What what does that look like from a vision standpoint in your field? Um, at the same time, controlling that content so that the narratives are um, presented in a way that puts both areas in a bright light. Well, I think you're right on. I mean, there's a, there's a very very much a challenge in in our industry for those of us who are believing, practicing uh, Christians or whatever our faith may be. But as a Christian man, uh, there are certain times where there are challenges. And and um, as far as vision goes, I do think that there's a lot of opportunity now more than ever, um, regardless of what industry a person may be in. I think now really looking at the fact that the playing field has kind of been leveled in, in many ways, but I'll speak particularly to, to the entertainment industry. If you look at now the fact that everything has really been shut down due to COVID, you are able to turn on your TV, your television, or whatever you watch content on, and perhaps you are going to look at uh, The Daily Show. Well, now Trevor Noah is doing that from his house. Jimmy Fallon, Jimmy Kimmel, they're doing that from their homes. And and, and and in essence, it's not that much different than perhaps a YouTube blogger, right? Of course, they have more following and perhaps more of a cultural relevance. But the lev the playing field has kind of been leveled by the fact that people can't really congregate in the studios in the same way at this time. And so there's a moment that we all really have to try to utilize as artists in being innovative and really trying to create perhaps either content or a platform for content. I'm more for the for the latter, because I think it's important that we as artists have our own platforms and we aren't always trying to get our stuff seen on somebody else's platform. Um, I believe that if you build it and it's of substance and it's worthy, people will come, whatever it is. Uh, but to speak on the Christian world and looking at content that could be had and done from the Christian viewpoint, I think there's so much possibility, but more than that, there's so much need for it. And oftentimes, of course, it's not always about race, but I think that when you look at the the content that is produced um, from the Christian narrative, the Judeo-Christian narrative, you're oftentimes, and perhaps most times, seeing it from a very whitewashed perspective, whether that's Jesus, whether that's Noah, <laughs> or or the disciples or whoever it is. And while that shouldn't necessarily totally distract us from the message of these stories, I do think it's important that we are able to look at a historically accurate perspective of these people as much as we're looking at the messages, the the teachings and the spiritualism that's brought forth from it, the religion that's brought forth from it. And I look at stories like Job, as you know, which is one of my favorite books in the Bible, um, certainly in the Old Testament and his journey, uh, everything that took place with him. And I think that'd be something that would just be a wonderful um, experience to be able to watch and see kind of almost in real time as it's happening. It's, it's a great, great book to be able to read, along with so many others. And there's room for it. And, and I know now more than ever, it doesn't take as much resources or money as people might think to be able to produce such content. I think it really is about um, quality. It, it is not also necessarily connected to finance and money or quantity um, in, in, in many different ways. And so in looking at these stories and looking at uh, the faith, 
I think it's important that Christians not only look for things that uh, inspire, empower, and uh, keep us keep us in the faith, but we should also be looking at how can we build, what would could we do, and I certainly do as an artist, what could I be doing artistically that can empower my people? My people being the people who are following Jesus, the people who believe. And there's so many ways. Uh, but to start with, you know, one idea is uh, to produce a, a production of, of the book of Job. But the vision goes far. I think that there's so much that can be uh, mined. I think being able to watch um, things like, uh, you know, he hearing the, the wonderful music on a regular basis, gospel music, being able to hear sermons and what you're doing. You know what many churches are doing, but specifically looking at what you're doing, the virtual sermons and, and really being able to continue to engage with the congregation and, and the world at large. That's a, a huge, huge leap in terms of what it is to to now be present in a way that before COVID really wasn't the case, certainly not to this extent. So that's part of the mm -hmm. vision. I mean, you have a platform yourself. Um, as a church and, and many do and, and how people use it, what kind of content they put on there will certainly be um, uh, helpful for believing Christians. Yeah, I don't think there's any limit um, to those of us as believers to dream and to inspire others to dream um, that I, be I believe uniquely COVID has revealed to us um, some things that has um, shown us um, that um, the avenues are there and open to one. Um, and so those are conversations I know we've talked about having in the past and certainly we need to have um, in the future um, of being able to um, take advantage of that niche, that market. Um, I think in many ways, that's what Tyler Perry, Perry did, um, not as directly, but um, um, but certainly there was more than that field. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and there, there is an audience that is um, starving for diversity, but also from the Christian, if I dare say it like this, moral perspective. Um, again, yeah. it's not that our Christians personally perfect that perspective, um, um, but at the same time, it's what we embrace, it's what we're comfortable with, it's what we want our children to see, um, it's yeah. what we want as alternative avenues to have a church function and be able to watch a movie um, and not have cringing scenes or things that may become uncomfortable um, um, throughout it. I think Passion of the Christ and um, some of the, some of the, I think some of the harsh treatment that Mel Gibson got um, was more connected to that than um, some of the other things it was pointed towards. And maybe those things were a part of it. Um, but I think also was a part of it was um, his conviction um to uh, represent that as you um as you look at the future and as you personally um sort of um, pull all these experiences together uh what do you see just i know we talk from a general's perspective of dreaming but just from a personal perspective what are some of the things that you kind of uh see yourself kind of moving into in this area of of content and being creative and an actor and, and so on. Okay. Well, I, I definitely, um, and, and shout out to, to Don Sanders. I appreciate you watching the show. And it was so important for uh, us to be able to reach vets and that vets were able to appreciate it as well. Um, so coming off of that, that project was really the best job I'd ever had. I mean, it, it was a, a job that really raised the bar for me personally in terms of what was required from me. I worked 12, 14 hour days and we're outdoors the majority of that time. Uniforms on, running through the desert in Santa Clarita with, with um, uh, semi-automatic weapons that had blank uh, ammunition in it. And so we were able to work on a level that is really the level I intend to continue to work on, if not, uh, you know, going even higher. And to speak in more detail, I'm looking at characters that are, excuse me, uh, leading men, you know, action, action stuff. I've always loved, uh, for instance, martial arts movies, um, looking at like Jim Kelly from uh, back in the day, Black Belt Jones, or looking at movies uh, with Jim Brown. 
Um, there was a great movie, uh, Three the Hard Way. All of the, the guys were in it, or different things that really, uh, excuse me, nose is running a little bit. Um, different things that really uh, show range. I think of great examples of actors like Denzel. You know, as an actor, he's really been able to to show an incredible range of the black male experience. I mean, every film you see him in is going to be slightly different experience. It's never just the same or, or Sam Jackson or, or many different others. And um, there are different projects that I want to be able to do, but I also train in martial arts and, and I'm actually just getting back into training. And so there's different projects that I have in mind that I want to be able to utilize that with as well. Um, but coming from the theater as someone who is a theater trained actor, I also love the classics. I love Pardon me. I love being able to um, uh, see different plays that are being produced into film. And so uh, August Wilson, for instance, who was a great black writer, uh, yes, one sir. of the yes, best writers in the African-American tradition. But looking at just the American canon, uh, he's one of the best writers. Um, his films are being produced. Netflix just did um, uh, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. But those projects are projects that I'm looking to be in. I know that they're producing uh, his whole um, um, American saga. There's 10 plays uh, that take place in the 20th century that he wrote, and they just produced the first of 10. Uh, so I look to, to be involved in at least one of them. Um, the other things uh, I look at, to go back to, to your point, your earlier point, about Christian stories, the Christian narrative, or perhaps they may not be uh, stories directly from the Bible, but about Christians who have lived and experienced something that have been inspiring and that could inspire us today. Uh, looking at the early Christians, um, looking at the, the human beings who, who first, uh, you know, the first martyrs after Jesus as they uh, were trying to spread the good news. Look at Paul, for example, or others. I'm, I'm really looking at really kind of a broad spectrum of stories, stories that mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned, my primary concern is really to empower black men and women and children. Uh, and by extension, people of color at large and, and hopefully the world. But I I find that, you know, being mainstream and working in the mainstream and all of that, you know, for popularity or fame or awards is all well and good. But what are we doing that's actually going to be serviceable to our people and not just entertaining. It's great to be entertaining, but I imagine in the best case scenario, being able to do both, entertain and be of service. And hopefully that service is to empower, educate, inform, uh, transform different people. And Lord knows we need it. <laughs> we need it. And so that's really the kind of work that I intend to be doing. I will be directing in the future. I just actually directed uh, my first web series called The Quest for Solomon's Treasure uh, with First Stage Theater in Milwaukee. And I'm producing and will be uh, directing things in the future. But generally speaking, the stories I want to tell are kind of kind of broad. Wow. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, uh, we're praying for you, pulling for you. And I want to be connected in that journey. Um, uh, thank you for your time. I want to leave on a couple of lighter notes uh, here. Uh, let's start with your uh, top five movies of all time. Uh, let, let's go there. Five movies. Oh, wow. Um, you know, that's a hard one. Uh, let's see. Off the top of my head, um, in no particular order either. Um, <sighs> Lady Sings the Blues. I love that movie. Um, <laughs> Friday After Next. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Man on Fire, The Godfather Part Two, and maybe Heat. Listen to him, ladies and gentlemen. It's not. It's not a bad list. It's not a bad list. It's. It's not a bad list. I mean, I have to keep my commentary to myself because he is actually. A professional in this area, so uh, uh, but yeah, you, know, uh, you were talking about uh, Broadway and you were able to see certain shows on Broadway. 
uh, give us your top uh, maybe three, three to five Broadway shows um, and um, maybe the top one or two, why they, why they, why they, rank, where they rank. Okay. Well, number one, hands down, I saw Fela while I was out there. Um, I think I was still a freshman when, when Fela was running and that, is single-handedly one of the most transformative, um, inspiring theater experiences I've ever had. It, it, those who aren't familiar is about Fela Kuti, who was a, a very interesting uh, Nigerian musician, very prominent in the 70s, uh, 60s, 70s. And his music really uh, influenced not only uh, African culture, but culture all around the world. Uh, incredible life story, and his story was kind of put into the format of a um, what they would call like a, a jukebox musical. So you heard his music as the life of his, um, or as the story of his life uh, would, was to progress throughout the hour and a half that we were in there. And by the end of that experience, you have everybody up on their feet dancing and just having a great time. Um, and it wasn't all just the happy, you know, joyous experience. There was some really hard moments because there was a lot of problematic stuff going on in this brother's life. But it was a very incredible experience. So, uh, Fela, um, I saw Angela Bassett and Sam Jackson do The Mountaintop, which was written by Katori Hall, who was a, a writer. We went to uh, the same school. She was, I think, um, in her last year when I was just getting there or graduating. Um, and it's about Martin Luther King kind of the night before he's assassinated at the Lorraine Motel. Um, interesting play, but great performances. And I got to uh, meet them afterwards and, and wonderful. So three, um, there was a, a production I saw, which technically was off Broadway, but better than most Broadway that I saw at St. Anne's Warehouse and it was called uh, Doll's House. It was an adaptation of this uh, Henrik Ibsen play, a classic play. Um, and it was pretty amazing. It was a South South African acting company that came and, and they did this incredible uh, adaptation of it. And, and that has, has been with me since I've seen it. <laughs> wow. Wow. Uh, I'm interested in uh, seeing all of them. I'm not, I'm not familiar with any any of those, I'm all the commercial um, Broadway and theater, some, some Lion underground. King. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Lion King, Ham Hamilton, and stuff like that. Um, okay. Color Purple, uh, you know. But I've seen some great, great shows. But I'm glad you schooled us there, at least myself there, on some stuff that I need to be on the lookout for uh, when it when it comes to town or be. Uh, uh, reperformed or you present it back again um and so on uh thanks again uh for your time thanks again for sharing praise god for the lack thereof of technical difficulties on this time around uh, yeah. i think this, this this conversation is for the ages now uh for people to come together and uh hear it i hope some young people who have passion and interest into the field will hear it and be encouraged by uh, your um be encouraged by your courage and uh, your discipline um, in this area. I want to pray um, and then um, we're going we're gonna to get out of here. Be on the lookout Thursday, y'all, for Theological Thursday. Uh, Pastor Keelan Atkinson will be here with us. Uh, check out Hurt for the Hurting uh, YouTube channel. Be on the lookout for our upgrade on our website, uh, h4h.la. Uh, as always, your fiscal support uh, for our radio broadcast that takes place uh, Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. and 1 a.m., Saturday at 8.30, um, in our television broadcast at 10.30 a.m. on the Now Network, our live call-in radio show at 6 p.m. Uh, on Sundays. Uh, certainly, we uh, solicit your uh, support and your um, participation in tuning in to those various um, networks. Remember, church, uh, Sinai, our new website is coming. Um, it will be uh, uploaded tomorrow morning. Uh, so it's anywhere between one to 24 hours. Our new logo, check it out right there. That's our new logo um, and our website. And look out for the branding material of that. And um, we're feeding. Uh, today was pizza at noon. 
Uh, I think we had a lot of pizza left over for the first day. So make sure that you get the word out, those especially in the community. Tomorrow, same thing at noon, uh, chicken and potato salad uh, for Chris C&W's. And then Friday, uh, the groceries have been picked up. They'll be packaged. We need volunteers to help with that, help with um, coming to the campus at noon for our guests that will show up and getting that information to them about our church as we feed them. And then Sunday, our grab and go at noon, we'll have Woody's barbecue on Sunday. So uh, families of four and more and our seniors uh, pre-order your um, your food. And for the rest of you, line up here about 1130 um, to ensure that you get a plate. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Jeremy. Uh, thank you for the gifts and talents that you have placed in him and entrusted him with. Thank you for this unique season of his life, of marriage, of professional advancement. Thank you for his courage. I pray, Father, for every um, penny that uh, he sacrificed for um, his integrity and his character and his convictions, that you would give him tenfold of that. Um, all these things we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. All right, y'all. We out. Thanks for listening. Share this and tune Thank in. Thank you. Third.